What's going on, Navigation Nation? Welcome to the web class where we're going to be talking about the new up and coming small exchange. We've got special guest with us today, Tom Sosnoff from Tasty Trade. Tom, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. Good day. Doing great. Well, to, to start with, to give our, our listeners some context about your background, I want to go through a couple of different phases of where you've been, where you've been throughout your career and, and get to the point. And then we're, I want to end talking about the small exchange and really dive into that to get some, some questions answered on that and, and tell us more about it. So let's start with when you first started, you were on the CBOE. You were a floor trader. You're in your twenties. You are running around Chicago with, with your buddies as a floor trader, making a ton of money. Just with as retail traders today, I think we all kind of look at that with a little bit of fascination. So tell us about your time as a floor trader. Well, it was actually almost two. I did it for almost two decades. And so I think 19 years total was my time on the floor. Um, so it was, you know, it was kind of a, I think I was in the right place at the right time. Just lucky. You know, it's that uh, sometimes you just, you're in the, you're born in the right era. And, and the, the trading floor was um, like this last crazy frontier of just um, really brutal um, capitalism. I mean, it was, it was, it was almost in its purest form. Um, and, and I was just a, I grew up in New York and went to state school in New York. And when I got to school, I got a job at a brokerage firm in New York and, and met some guys out there. And they said, if, if you move to Chicago, and I didn't even know, honestly, I was one of those New Yorkers that thought, you know, the whole country ended at the end of the East River, just outside of Manhattan. And so I had never been west of Pennsylvania. Um, so so I figured that uh, Chicago was, I didn't even know where Chicago was. And flew out to Chicago, met this guy who was going to give me a tour of the trading floor. And as soon as I walked on the trading floor, it was the old trading floor before they had really built up any of, it's kind of like an old annex to the Board of Trade. And I walked on the trading floor and I hung out for probably, I don't know, about a half hour to an hour. And everybody was yelling and screaming. And I didn't have any idea what was going on, but I thought it was the coolest place in the world. It looked like to me like a, like it looked like the end of a race, but it went on for hours, like a, like a, like a harness race or a horse race or something like that. And, and everybody's just yelling and screaming and papers were flying. And I was like, oh my God, this is the coolest place I've ever seen. So I took the job, which wasn't really a job, it was just working for a couple of guys. And, and uh, moved to Chicago and 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 decided to learn the business. I lasted for, you know, I lasted for 20 years. And um, and I built a nice, you know, we built a nice prop business in a 20 year period. Not everybody made it, but you know, I was one of the few, and, and that was good. You know, it was it was a good life. Like and you said, how, good life. and was and was there a was there a specific time or, or point in your floor trading career when you kind of when it clicked and you, and you really felt like okay, I've made it. Yeah, a couple of years. Um, uh, the first year was really hard. Like I didn't know if I was going to make it because I didn't um, I didn't really understand the terminology and I, I wasn't as strong. Um, I was quick, but I wasn't as strong in math as other people were. So and everything was in fractions and that was completely new to me, you know, adding and subtracting all these because remember, options are strategic. So everything comes in combinations of spreads and combinations of orders. And so there was a lot of fractions and, and these guys were, you know, all these other guys were really fast. I mean, they were doing it like they were like, they were like mini computers way before there were computers. And, and my brain didn't work the same way with fractions. So it took me a little while, but by the second year, um, I was just as fast as everybody. So, um, and so I, so I made it, you know, I don't know why, but sometimes some people make it, some people don't. I just was lucky. And I turned the corner probably in the second year and, and then it was pretty much, you know, I, ran, I, I, I had a nice run for 20 years. And, and you guys are young. You're in your 20s to begin with. Yeah. And, you're, and you're running around. You've, I've heard you tell a story about how, you know, you guys have you have seats at the Chicago Bulls right behind the bench. During the games, you guys are making bets with Michael Jordan during the game. Tell, tell, us, tell us a little Michael Jordan story. Well, okay, this, this is so, 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 you know, Michael was drafted. Um, by the Bulls and it's 19, it's it's just after the Olympics, 1984, he's a rookie. And they, um, the Bulls were like one of the worst teams. I don't know if you remember, 
How old are you? I'm 40. 40. Okay, yeah, this is this is way before your time. So the Bulls are the, the Chicago Stadium is a really cool place, the old Chicago Stadium, but the Bulls are a horrible, horrible team. And there's about three or 4,000 people at night at the game. And they, um, they draft Michael. And all of a sudden, you know, the Bulls get a little, got a little, um, you know, they got a little extra jump in their step. And they went around, they couldn't sell these new floor seats. So they came to all the, they came to the trading offices and they not, just started cold calling and knocking on doors to see who would buy seats at $75 a seat. When you think about it, these are, you know, floor seats at $75, which for 1984, 19, 1984 was, was, was kind of a lot of money. Um, and, but we were the only crazy people making, you know, crazy money back in 1984. So they offered us the two center, uh, sorry, four, four seats on center court. And we were like, well, we should try him for a year. And then one of my buddies kicks me and goes, hey, the Bulls stink. Let's just take the seats next to Michael Jordan. So we took the four seats next to Michael instead of the four seats at, at center court. And then we just became, you know, he was only a kid. We were 25 and and he was 20, you know, 22 or something, whatever the age was, you know, at the time. Or we were 20. I was, let's see, the 1984. I was, I was 27 and, and he was 22 or 23. And um, so we all just became friends and, you know, we'd go out after the game, play poker, like at my house and, you know, or his, at, at one of the guys' houses. And, and it was just a stupid relationship that lasted for like, you know, 15 years. And it was kind of fun, but then he started making too much money. And then, and uh, the first night we ever played poker, it's a good story. The first night we played poker with Michael Jordan, he brought a lot of money with him and he, he lost it to all these traders that were there. And he was so embarrassed that he ran out of money, but we made his credit good, but he wouldn't take any credit from us. And then, and he went out and found some money, came back, and then the game lasted for the next 15 years. And um, he got his money back a couple times over. That's so, great. What a great story. It's kind of crazy. You know, the funniest thing about Michael was that he's the only guy in the whole world that you could, because we were all married and stuff, you know, and he's the only guy in the whole world that you could have come over in the middle of the week on a Wednesday or Thursday night and play cards until three or four in the morning and smoke cigars in your house. And your wife would be like, can I get you guys something? <laughs> you know, like with any of my other friends, they would have been thrown out. That's great. But, um, they, they were really fun. You know, it was fun. I have, I've lost contact with him like 15 years ago. You know, he got too big for us. Gotcha. Forgot about the small guys, huh? No, he just, you know, his, his life, his life got big. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay, so fast forward, you, you leave the floor yeah. and because you see the writing on the wall, right? You see that everything's getting computerized. The the life of, as a floor trader is not going to be the same. And yeah. and you and a partner, Scott Sheridan, correct me if yeah. I'm wrong, decide to start a retail trading platform. Yes, this is true. And back when I was trading back then and I, at the time I was using TradeStation and Interactive mm -hmm. Brokers and those were those were names. I mean, you say that name, you think of a trading platform. Yeah. You guys started something called Think or Swim. Yeah. First off, how'd you come up with that name and what was that all about? Oh, well, actually, we, we ran, we had a pretty successful business and we had saved, um, we ran a prop business. You know, we had a bunch of traders and that worked for us and we traded ourselves. So we were pretty successful. But we, at that point in 1999, I just thought, like, I got to, I want to do something different. You know, it's time to do something different. And so um, we took all the money we had made over the past, you know, Scott and I have been partners for like 10, 15 years at that point, 15 years almost. And we, we decided we just rolled the dice and, and I came up with the name just fooling around at home, you know, kind of talking to my dog. <laughs> and, uh, and I ran the name by Scott and he's like, he didn't really care about names. He's like, he's like, we can always change the name later, if, you know, cause it's kind of a stupid name. We'll always change it later. And people liked the name and we ended up, you know, wasn't our original idea to build just a brokerage firm. There was a lot more to it, but it kind of consumed us. And so, you know, we got consumed in the project and we just went crazy over it for the next, you know, 10 years and it became our lives. And um, that's really it. I mean, it wasn't, you know, we didn't do anything. We didn't do anything like special except hire really smart people and, and work really hard. I mean, that's, that's it. And so now, so now you're a retail trader. So now you're one of us. Yeah. And I'm one of you for sure. Right. And so, 
you know, I, I, so we have a community of, of traders and I just presented a question a few weeks ago and I, and I kind of knew where it was going to go as far as what kind of answers I was going to get. And I was correct. And almost every single, the, the question I asked was, what's your number one challenge as a trader? And the, the answers that I got were all about, you know, discipline, emotion, trading too big, fear of missing out, getting in too early, getting out too late, those kind of things. As a, if you can think back, I mean, as a new trader, what kind of, what kind of suggestions do you have to help people with, help newer traders get over those emotions or psychological issues when it comes to trading? Well, you know, it, th there's a, I can, I can, I can kind of read you, you know, I, I can kind of, I'm not read you, but I can kind of list off, you know, a series of me mechanics and, and steps that we, that, that I follow or, or, or different tenants to the, kind of the foundationally how I think. But, you know, as a new trader or even um, anybody that's trying to, you know, turn the corner, go to the next level, or even get better at what they do. And, and, and by the way, let's be fair, Steve. I think that, you know, over the last couple of years, like I've been doing this now since 1981, but I think over the last, I'm going to say two and a half or three years, you know, I, I've gotten to be a much better trader than I was just three or four years ago. And compared to what I was 10 or 20 years ago, it's not even close. Like what, you know, how, what we are today, just the way we think and, you know, how, how our brains process everything that we do. But the key to success is, um, and, and, and a lot of them are just, you know, I, I can easily say things like just, you know, like discipline that, but I'm not going to. I, the key to success is, is um, being able to make decisions and being confident in your decisions. And I believe that that carries over to for whatever you do. So like if you're a trader, great. And if you're a trader who also has a business, great. If you're a, a trader that also works in another business, that's great too. If you're an investor that likes trading or you're an investor that works somewhere else, that works. If you own your own business, that works. People that can make decisions. They're, they're, decision making is a skill and trading is nothing, nothing but, you know, decision making. And so, so I'm, I, I focus most of my life now trying to engage people. I call it, you know, teaching them to finance. And the, and the concept of teaching people to finance is, is about teaching people to make decisions. And I don't really care. It, the more decisions you make, the easier it becomes to make decisions and the more successful you ultimately are. So when people talk about trading, I mean, really, what is it? There's, there's, there's definitely a set of mechanics. You can't just, make decisions, you know, you can't blindly make decisions, but, but it's the process of making as many decisions as you can that really changes the way you think about taking risk and about assessing risk, about taking risk, about, um, about everything from taking losses to taking profits and everything else. Decisions that come quickly to you that don't have this huge emotional holdback or, or, um, or pullback, you know, those are the most successful people. He, he or, or, or her who, can make the quickest decisions um, is usually the most successful. That's great. That's great information. And and uh, kind of along those lines, and we had you on, last time we had you on was in December of 2017. Wow. And and at that time, I, I asked you about Bitcoin because it was all it was all the sure. rage, right? Bitcoin was over sixteen thousand dollars at that point, and I just asked you what what your thoughts were as a currency, as you know where it was going, that kind of thing. And your comments, what your comment was, you, you kind of looked at it from an expected move standpoint, and you said, "Well, it could be, it could go as high as thirty, it could go, you know, under five. And you said. My bet is it's going under five, which obviously that was a that was a great call. But what what was your main for something like that? What was your main assessment of why you would make that call? Well, first of all, I'm a freak about math. So so and over the years, you know, and you you give me an efficient marketplace like Bitcoin, and I, I would argue that Bitcoin was in a bubble, but it was also efficient. And the implied volatility of Bitcoin at the time you know, was probably when it was 16 or 18,000 was probably approaching 150 to 200 percent. So the math just suggested the expected range. That's all that was. But for me, you know, anytime I, I've witnessed a lot of bubbles in my career and I felt like that was just a massive bubble. You know, there's a lot of ways. Not, there's no such thing as mean reversion with respect to price. So just because something goes up doesn't mean it's going to go down. There, there is such a thing as mean reversion with respect to volatility. So, so I knew that the, 
the range of Bitcoin was going to contract dramatically. But um, so so mean reversion applies as a statistical as a statistical or math model applies to volatility, but it doesn't apply to price. But with respect to price, you know, there's there's kind of sometimes there's price extreme that that seems like it's a derivative of common sense. And in the case of Bitcoin, you know, uh, m the easiest measurement for me is is kind of when my mom, who was 85 years old at the time, you know, calls me up and says, how come we're not long Bitcoin? <laughs> I'm pretty <laughs> sure. I'm pretty sure, you know, um, that my short position, I was short, actually. I'm pretty sure that my short position was going to be good. <laughs> you know? um, but there's a lot of tells out there. But, you know, I mean, I think Bitcoin was probably the most obvious bubble of the last, you know, last few years. I mean, easily the most obvious bubble. Right. Okay. So continuing on, you, you've got Thinkorswim. You ended up, you ended up taking Thinkorswim public. Was that to raise additional capital? It was not. It was to acquire, um, it was to grow our um, customer base. So we acquired Investools, which was an investor education company. And um, they had a lot of customers and, um, and they were a public company. So it was like we, we, we became a public company through the acquisition of Investools. And you're the you're the CEO of this now public company. Yeah. And so you're the one doing the quarterly conference calls, giving the earnings announcements, giving the uh, earnings projections, all that stuff that public companies do. And to kind of drive the point home that nobody knows what's going to happen, especially from a price standpoint, you knew the numbers, right? You knew the numbers before the public did, but yet – even in that situation, you still can't predict what price is going to do after after you announce the earnings. Absolutely impossible. In fact, so so I've been part of the public company environment. When we were public, our symbol was SWIM, S-W-I-M. And then when we were bought out by TD Ameritrade, TD Ameritrade was public. And I was um, a party to, you know, I was um, uh, I was a member of their, you know, um, senior member so of their management committee so so i also knew the non-public you know the non-public numbers and we would sit around and and you know just like you know talk to each other and say you know do you think this is good or bad and and you know somebody would say well i think these numbers are great we beat by two cents and i'm like that doesn't mean you know that doesn't mean a damn thing like i don't think people that 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 run public companies have any idea what their stock is going to do when they, you know, when they put the numbers out. I just don't think it's possible. I, 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 I was, I was easily the only trader on the senior, you know, on the senior management committee at both. Well, not and Scott was too at our firm, but there were other board members and people that, you know, had, had access to, you know, not to material, uh, non-public information. And I don't think anybody, you know, would have any clue what the stock would do. And we, for sure, as, even as traders, didn't even know how we would have played it if we could have played it. You know, I was much more fearful of what the market would do. Like when you're pushing out an earnings report in 2000, end of 2008 or early 2009, when the market's in free fall, I was much more worried about, oh man, we have to launch an earnings report tomorrow morning when the, you know, when the S&Ps are down 6%. You know, there's no way you're going to, you're, you're going to come out smelling good in that move. Yeah. So, you know, I, the answer is I don't believe that any public company, I don't believe if you had the numbers on any earnings report on any company in the world, you'd have any idea what to do. I don't believe if you knew what the Fed was going to do based on interest rates, that would have any, you could make money knowing what the Fed was about to do if they were making an interest rate announcement. I just don't think it's possible. I don't think it's easy. So it's safe to say nobody knows anything. That's, that's, it's, it, it's, yes, that is, um, you can just write that on the tombstone. <laughs> Very good. So, okay. So then you sell toss to TD for a cool 750 mil. Yeah. And you complete your contractual obligations with them. You don't really want to be part of, of that going forward. And so you, the next thing you do is you start, and this was, I think about eight years ago, you start tasty trade. Yeah, that's right. And this is to provide retail traders access to content and what what was the thought process initially behind starting tasty trade well when we sold when we sold um I think we're some to td cuz um uh at that point you know i had to stay on for 2 years and and i did um i was supposed to stay on for 3 years but i asked them if I, they would let me leave and they said yes i i 
TD was a good firm and they had good people there, but um, I couldn't work in that environment. It wasn't, I'm, I had been, I'd never got a paycheck in my life. I've been self-employed since I was, you know, 21, 22 years old. And so I didn't want to live in that environment. And um, so I asked if I could leave and I, they said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to go start a, um, I'm going to go start, I'm going to try to disrupt financial media because I think that we built really cool technology, but I don't think people have the right content yet. And the content that's being um, disseminated outside of brokerage platforms, you know, the content that's being disseminated over, you know, CNBC and Bloomberg and, and Reuters and, and all these other places, it's not that they're disingenuous and not that they're trying to do something that, that's, that they know is wrong. It's just they don't really understand what people – you know, what people need to learn. They, they don't get the math part of it. There's no strategic angle to it. So we decided to disrupt, try to disrupt financial media and build this crazy company called Tasty Trade. And actually TD Ameritrade was our first investor. Um, and we built this company and we were just, hey, we're hoping we can pull this off and it works and all this kind of stuff. And and it was um, pretty wildly successful and and it it just kept growing and growing and growing until it became the largest you know, digital um, financial uh, digital network in the world, and in two years ago we launched Tasty Work. So um, that that's pretty much you know how it worked. It was fun. It's been an amazing run. Like I, I'm so happy we did it because I I would never trade this experience for anything. It's been incredible. And so you you're providing this content. Not only is it entertaining, but it's also very math and research driven. You build an internal think tank research yeah. team within Tasty Trade. What what would you say is maybe the top three pieces of research that has really taken your trading to another level? Um, there's a couple things. Uh, first, I never, when we were floor traders, it was always about trading big. And my, um, you know, it was like go big or go home type thing. And I never understood the concept of trade small, trade often. And I didn't really understand law of large numbers. And, and so I was, I, it was just absolutely shocking to me, you know, how big we used to trade and how, how small and active we trade right now. It's completely different. So I would say number one, it's the trade small trade often. It's, it's a thousand times better way to approach, you know, this business. We couldn't do that until we were effective, until we were able to effectively build our own rate schedule and until we were able to build the technology that supports that, but that's number one. Number two um, would be managing trades early. I, I, um, I don't think that I ever, I think we did it by default, but we didn't do it because we knew what we were doing. And after we've done research for now for eight years, and this is using, you know, I mean, we do 50, to 60 hours of research every single day with you know eight data scientists and all this other kind of stuff, and the whole concept of managing early is it, it makes you it makes everything we do so mechanical. So so there's the trade small trade off and there's managing early, and then I think the final piece is is we've we've become um, almost addicted to slash dedicated to um, implied volatility rank, which is which is using um, which is building a measure of how we rank implied volatility on a scale of one to a hundred so that we can easily make decisions based on IV rank, as opposed to making decisions based on something subjective. And it's really helped us, you know, narrow it's, it's, it's narrowed us into using just, you know, quantitative stuff to figure out trades and nothing else. So, so those would be the three it's, it's the dependence on implied volatility rank and to simplify the context around implied volatility, it's trade small trade off and, and it's managing trades early. And those would be the you know three things that, that really stand out after eight years of doing research. Excellent. And then at this point, you are you're still kind of you've got it's called a marketing arrangement with T D Thinkorswim, but sure. you you don't have control over the costs. And so you guys disrupt the industry again and you start Tasty Works. Yeah. And and one of the biggest you know, disruptors was, was the commission schedule, uh, which, which you initiated with zero commissions to close trades. Right. Why did you, why did you do zero to close trades? Why not just do a cheaper in and out? Um, just because we wanted to do something different. So we decided to do cheaper. 
we we made our rates in way cheaper than everybody else, and we included out in that because we wanted to really. Um, we felt like if we did something incredibly aggressive, that it would change not only the rest of the industry, but it would change the way people. It would allow people to trade small trade often because you close a trade costs nothing, and so um, Tastyworks was revolutionary in the sense that we could, you know, change the the way commissions were structured in the industry. But you know what was also really cool is we built technology. It's very underappreciated technology because at this point it's 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 all high frequency, which nobody else has. And it's it's all built to let you, you know, roll trades, um, roll trades up and down, adjust trades and do everything that no other platform can do. And it's all in front of you on one screen. So I there's we 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 got the technology that we wanted and we got the fee structure that we wanted and we were able to embed the content that we wanted and so we feel like we give people you know we don't charge for anything by the way you know nothing everything's free except the the commissions so so we feel like we gave a really good offer you know it was a, it was a really good um just a really good offer to people to to come on over and it's worked it's it's fastest growing brokerage firm um in the US fastest growing kind of traditional brokerage firm in the US is there any new features or anything new coming as, as it relates to the brokerage platform that, that's coming that you can talk about? Yeah. So, well, we'll, we'll be launching Portfolio Margin in a couple of weeks. We will be adding um, cash, bit, cash uh, digital currencies to the platform. Um, we're about to go into test mode for that. We are going to be launching something called um, a test drive platform, which will allow people to actually test out our soft, software for a day or so if they've if they make a little money, you know, we'll, um, trading stocks on it, we'll let them keep it. And <laughs> just, it's kind of a fun little um, marketing thing we're going to be doing. We're going to be launching something called Option Tracker, Option Chains, which is an option tracker, which allows you to track individual positions um, from start to finish, regardless of the number of adjustments and 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 anything like that. That's huge, um, huge. It's huge. It's huge. We've been building it for two years, so I know how huge it is. It's just, it's a massive amount of work. We're deploying a brand new um, mo a simplified mobile app, um, and then we have a couple of uh, we have a couple of kind of really cool little treats that we I can't talk about yet, but that are also coming <laughs> that are that are that are things that don't currently exist in the industry. So we're playing around with some um, with some really neat little um, gadgets and stuff, and and you know we also do uh, live shows around the country all year long. We do, we're doing 27 live events this year all over the country. So we're pretty aggressive. I was in Omaha for the, he said, she said last year. That was a really cool event. Yeah. We're going to do it this year. This year it's fun. We're in like, that was the small show we've ever done that show in Omaha last year. And uh, we wanted to try a city with 600,000 people. Um, this year we're back to a little bit bigger shows, but yeah, we loved it. That was fun. Cool. All right, so let's get into what we're really here today. Thanks, thanks for that background. I think that really gives our listeners some good context of where you've been, where cool. you're going. And I want to talk about this small exchange and go ahead and take over my screen whenever you get a chance. But the first question I have is, what, what is the role of an exchange? What, what do they do? do they, you know, they create the products. They clear the orders. They, they are kind of the market makers at this point. Tell us, what is an exchange? What, what's their well, role? The, the role of an exchange, exchange is, is a facilitator. Yeah, don't think of the role. Um, um, exchanges actually don't clear the trades. Um, the trades are cleared by, you know, some clearing group. It could be like OCC. It could be, could be CME, but they're, but they're not exchanges. Um, and the exchanges don't fill the orders. There's market making groups all over that actually are members of the exchange that are counterparty firms, liquidity providers, hedge funds. They make markets. Exchanges just provide the technology and the oversight to allow for the meeting of a customer and the facilitator um, or two customers to to um, so they can interact and, and make a trade. Basically, it's kind of something. So um, instead of person A trading with anonymous person B and that trade living, you know, anonymously on on in some ledger or that trade living somewhere else, this is just centrally cleared stuff. That's usually that could be fungible if the products are in different places. But essentially, this exchange role is as a facilitator. Person A meets person B and person A doesn't really care. Who person B is because the exchange is guaranteeing the trade. And that's all it is. 
And they and they create the products. So they create the symbols and that sort of thing. They create the products. Um, or they can license the product from somebody else, or they create the products, and um, they create everything. They create the symbols. They, they, you know, they market the products. Everything. There's, there's not that many exchanges, so it's very hard to build an exchange. And so, why are you guys building an exchange? Well, one of my, so I'm getting a little older, and I, I, one of the things I've always wanted to do is, you know, I feel like we've. We've really done some cool things on the broker side. We've done some amazing things on the media side. But one of my lifelong dreams was to disrupt the futures exchange business because I, there's only two major futures exchange, the CME and the ICE. And I feel like they're always been, they've always been designed to take care of the professional hedger or the institutional customer, and they've never been supportive of the individual investor. And it drives me crazy. And their products are too big, their fees are too high, and their technology is too old, and they don't have any standardization, and they don't support what an individual investor needs. And so about 15 years ago, I started to design an exchange, and I marketed it to the existing exchanges, suggest because I was busy and I had other things to do. And everybody loved it, but they were like, you know what, we just don't want to upset our model. And so... I didn't, I pulled it back. I tabled it for a while and I tabled it for 10 years. And then, and essentially now, you know, I brought it back out, but I, it's very different today than, than I was thinking about it 15 years ago. Um, and we have the capital to do it and we have the technology to do it today. Um, and we have the desire to do it. So we started a separate company um, called the small exchange. We're building products for individual self-directed investors the average um, futures product right now is about $100,000 in notional size. Some are 150, like bonds and S&Ps, things like that, and some are like you know 50, like like crude oil. But the average is out to over $100,000 for one contract. That's way too big when the average customer count is let's say 40 or $50,000 for traders. And so we need to have products that are significantly smaller. But when you have products that are significantly smaller, they need to have high enough implied volatility so they can move around a little bit. So we developed products for the small exchange that are standardized, meaning they don't, they don't like it's not fractions on one and decimals on another and each ticks the same and each expiration is the same and everything's cash settled and it's so much easier to understand. And the products are much smaller, they're like the equivalent of a hundred shares of stock. So an individual investor that's always been scared of futures because it's a hundred thousand dollar product can look at these products and go, oh, it's the same as a hundred shares of, you know, of the Qs, that kind of thing, size wise. I can handle that with slightly higher volatility, but, but, um, but it, you know, perfect size for me. And there's a lot of other really cool features of the small exchange. And it's just, it's, it's got a product design that, um, that we've been thinking about for a long time. It's got products that we build ourselves. We're not using anybody else's products. And most, most importantly, the small exchange is, has a matching engine, which is the engine that drives all exchanges that, we have built ourselves. We've spent the last almost two years building a matching engine. And so we didn't want to license the existing ones that are right now, most people that try to build exchange license an existing matching engine. So if you go to like, for example, Brazil or Mexico or somewhere, or even in the U S if somebody wants to start an exchange, they just license a matching engine from an existing exchange. The problem with that is you can't do anything special technology wise. We built something really special that's gonna do stuff that no other exchange technology has ever done before. And it's gonna allow customers to trade futures the way they trade options, the way they trade stocks. It's gonna be very, very different from any futures product currently. And, and all of that said, it's a customer exchange. So we're even letting customers buy subscriptions for a ridiculously low price that will eventually turn into seats when this exchange goes live. And so they'll have a lifetime of half price exchange fees. We're being extremely generous and giving away half of our future revenue just to get enough people on board so the exchange is successful when it launches. And, you know, back in the day or when you had a seat on an exchange, uh -huh. I mean, first of all, they were being sold for hundreds of thousands of dollars and then later millions of dollars. I mean, yeah. should this be looked at as, as something no. where you're, you're buying a seat and you're going to be able to sell it later for a lot more? No. Actually, we should not look at it that way because what you're buying is actually a subscription that will turn into a seat, but it's not 
designed to be an investment because there, this, there's going to be a lot more of these. What it's designed to do is save you a lot of money over time if you use these products. Can it go up in value? Yes. Are we selling it as if it's an investment and it can go up in value? The answer is no. So theoretically, it can go up in value and it's going to be open for um, it's going to be open in an auction marketplace a couple, once or twice a year. But we cannot sell it that way and we won't because because our goal is not to create seats that are to create to I'm sorry to create subscriptions that will be ultimately worth a lot of money. Our goal is to create subscriptions that will allow people to be engaged in the product. Like we're not interested in building, you know, an equity marketplace where people are just investing so they can make money. I, it, it'd be cool to do, but the crowdfunding rules don't appreciate, don't allow that. And the, and the um, regulatory rules do not allow for that either, but they do allow for like, you know, subscriptions, cooperatives where you can reduce um, on the back end, you can reduce fees and that's what we're doing. And so we're playing it, you know, totally kosher. We're making sure that we we're making sure that we give individual investors an opportunity. You know, imagine if you had bought a Costco membership that was good for life before Costco ever launched. And they said for a hundred dollars, this membership is good for life. And then for the next, you know, whatever, 20, 30 years of your life, you had a free membership to, to use Costco. That's worth something. You know, um, that's essentially what this is. It's not something that that's that's going to be worth a lot of money, but it's something that can save you, you know, a lot of money. Like my son, I'll give you an example, Steve. My son, when he was in college, he bought Amazon Prime membership for life for thirty dollars. And he can't trade. He can't sell it. He's not he, he got it under some student deal where he cannot sell it. He can't do anything, but he, he owns it for life for thirty dollars. Like wow. that's worth something to him. And that's how we view this, except you will be able to sell this. That's the only difference. I see. And, and so starting out an exchange like this, I mean, where is the where's the initial liquidity going to come from to to start these new products, getting volume, open interest to trade between sure. all the traders? Well, it's 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 a hell of a challenge. That's for sure. That's why that's why we're going to have between twenty five and thirty five thousand subscribers before we even launch the exchange. Um, but the liquidity side has to come from from very strong partners. And um, we recently we haven't announced it yet, but we will hopefully within the next month announce a list of our partners um, who are going to be providing liquidity to this exchange. And it's going to be I, I, at least I hope it's going to be a very impressive list um, of all the major players. Now, we have an advantage over other people trying to start an exchange in that um, we already have a massive amount of liquidity that goes through our platform. Uh, and so we already have a lot of liquidity providers that, that work very closely with us and that currently partner with us. So we're not like a brand new exchange coming in and saying, Hey, you know what, please make market for us. We're going to be, we're promised we're going to send you business. We already send them a ton of business. And when so, you say, so you got your liquidity providers, when you say other major players, is that other brokerage firms that will be routing orders to you? Well, that too, but that's not what I'm talking about. Okay. I'm saying I'm saying liquidity providers are firms that um, are the firms that that ma currently make markets for stocks and options. The exchanges, all the exchanges out there today, you know, they're just facilitators. So behind the exchanges are all these firms that make markets. The biggest being uh, Citadel, the second biggest being Ver2 and Susquehanna and and um, you know Peak Six and um, um, just Dash and IMC, and there's just a, there's a million firms out there. Um, we route orders to all those firms, and they facilitate the other side of our customer of our customer business. Those firms will be also supporting the small exchange because we have partnerships already in place with 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 many of them, and and you know they want you know this is how they make money, and this is so we think they're going to make pretty pretty good markets. The small exchange will be offering futures options too. So it's just a it's a futures exchange for launch and then it's futures options after launch, you know, maybe six months, or eight months after launch, we'll start launching futures options. So this exchange is going to be, you know, we're going to compete with the CME. We're going to compete with the IC. They're both 70, 75 billion dollar companies. And here we are, this little pissant, you know, startup exchange. And, um, you know, 
we're we're going to scare the children. <laughs> and, and and so what what's kind of the range of products that are going to be offered? Is it going to be something that gives you exposure in the financial markets and the commodities? And what what's kind of a range of the products that will be offered? So um, initially, we're not discussing all the products that we're going to offer, but initially. The, the range will be, um, and again, we've designed all our own products, but the range of products will be, um, you know, there'll be equity products, there'll be energy products, there'll be um, currency products, there'll be uh, uh, bond products, debt products, treasury products, I mean. Um, there will be precious metal products, there'll be volatility products, there'll be, you know, ultimately there'll be, hopefully there'll be digital currency, there'll be cannabis. Um, there'll be, you know, we're hoping in the end, Initially, there'll be five or six, and then followed by another five, followed relatively quickly by another five or six. I see. And then, and you think, would you say about eight or nine months afterwards, options should be coming on board on those different products? On the most liquid products, yes. So we have to see, you know, which products that we launch have the liquidity necessary to support an option marketplace. But um, assuming that we, um, Assuming that our guess is, you know, that that assuming that our hunches are right about, you know, the amount of business that we can drive and and how good our products are, um, we're hoping that there's there's a you know relatively vibrant marketplace for the options um, within six or eight months at least on the top, you know, four or five names. Cool. And, and so for our listeners who want to get involved, and everybody better be getting involved. I, I mean, there's no reason not to. It's a hundred dollar subscription fee. And is correct me, keep uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You you need to be you need to have a Tastyworks account to get involved. No, or not no, no, no. If you open a Tastyworks account, we give you the small exchange membership for free. It's our giveaway this year. We we pick up hundred dollars, basically what it is. Got it. If you don't, if you'd like to do it yourself, you can just go right to the smallexchange.com and sign up. There's a you have to. Um, you have to fill out a, a small form, then you have to sign a document which just says that this is what you want to do. And then we're not even collecting any money now. Um, I think in March we'll be sending out um, emails to collect the money. This just reserves your spot and make sure that you, you know, because we're going to cut this off in a, we're gonna, within a few months we're going to cut this off because we're going to be oversubscribed. And then when more people find out about this. And so, and we're not touching the money until the exchange is approved by the CFTC. So it's going to be held separately. So for any reason we don't get approved or anything like that, we will return all the money. We're not using it until after we're approved. The exchange is fully funded, just so you know. So we put up money, we've raised money, and um, uh, at this point the exchange is fully funded. And we will do. We're guessing we'll do a Series A round on the exchange sometime later this year or early next year. But for the time being, all the um, uh, all the startup capital was provided by. Uh, Tasty Trade and Peak Six. Um, Peak Six is a very large prop firm and investment firm in in uh, Chicago, and uh, we'll be announcing other investors very soon. Um, we have no individual investors, but we do have individual subscribers. But at and least, but at least initially, to actually trade the products that you're creating on the exchange, it'll be done through TastyWorks platform. Tasty works and there'll be other brokers signed up. We just don't know who yet. Got so it. far, so far, only a few brokers have already committed, but we think eventually we'll get to everybody. But if we don't, then customers will just, if they want to trade the product, they'll come over to tasty works. Um, but we think the other firms will, you know, um, will come over once they, once they see, you know, how cool the products are and, you know, and how people are trading it. And, and listen, if somebody leaves one firm to come to us to open an account, they'll eventually come over. You know, right. Right. Uh, OK. I, I mean, I don't have any other questions. I'm looking at the questions from our members. Uh, oh, oh, I know about the about the fees. Um, yeah. the, you're, you're looking at this uh, at cutting exchange fees, uh, basically approximately in half. Talk a little bit more about that. So we were trying to decide, you know, what's the best benefit we can give to, you know, to the only way the exchange makes money is on exchange fees for the product. So we said, if you sign up for this and as you're an early subscriber before we even you know launch, uh, before you can get approval, we're going to give you lifetime of no membership fees, no one half off exchange fees and reduced um, uh, reduced data fees. And we're doing data fees very 
different than anybody else has ever done them before. So it's something that we're trying to make this cheaper than trading, you know, anything else. And so it's a lifetime of half price fees. It's a lifetime of discounted data fees, and it's a lifetime of no subscription or seat fees or anything like that. It's not going to stay this way. Once we get approval, um, once we get exchange approval, you know, the, all the, all these rules for the next group in the, the price is going to go up to 500, the, the, there'll be annual fees, things like that. So we have a very different, you know, this is just kind of the initial offer. There's already, we're approaching, I believe we're getting close to 8,000 people are already signed up for this small exchange and it's only been announced a month ago. So, you know, we're cutting it off at 25,000. And, and will these ex- with these reduced exchange fees, does that apply just to the futures or options on futures as well once those everything. are available? Everything. Everything. Yeah, sure. And, and this, is in a, this is in an approval process. You guys have applied to open this exchange. And what, what's kind of the timeline that you're hoping or thinking this is going to come to fruition? Well, the government shutdown didn't help us last month but, um, <laughs> uh, because these are all government. CFTC is a government governmental agency, but um, uh, we are expecting approval in the third quarter. Third quarter. Yep, Q3. And yeah. our, our our technology is built, and our company. It's a separate company, um, and like I said, there's there's two um, fully announced partners now: Tasty Trade and Peak Six. But there'll be other announcements coming over the course of the next couple of weeks and months, and you'll see who else is involved. And it's, it's, you know what, Steve, it, it, this is, this is, I would be, it wouldn't be fair if I said this is anything other than a long shot, because that's what it is. But you know, we've done a lot of long shots, and um, we're 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 very strong technologists, and we're very strong disruptors in the financial space. And the small exchange is a really cool concept. It is just, it's simple, it's standardized, and it's going to be fun. That's great. And another question coming in, if you have a, let's let's just say you've got a Tastyworks account outside of the U.S. or you've got a brokerage account outside of the U.S., as long as you are approved on that broker in other countries, whatever products are available, they'll be able to trade. So if you're in Australia and you've got a Tastyworks, you're going to be able to trade these. Well, Tastyworks is Tastyworks Australia should be launching in a matter of days. So Australia is already covered. Um, if you're a, if you're an international customer listening to this listening to this webinar today, um, you can buy this membership. Even if you're in Canada, we we the, the the small exchange it's individuals only, and you can only buy one. It's not like you can't buy five or ten or anything like that. It's for individuals only. You can only buy one, and um, and you can buy it from anywhere, anywhere in the world, anywhere. And ultimately, you know, Tasty Works takes customers from 65 different countries, but we are not yet approved in Canada. But we are going through the process. Australia, we are, we're, we, we, I can say we're approved because we're 95% there. We're, we're just waiting for the final margin, but we will be approved. And then elsewhere in the world, it just depends what country. But for most countries, we're pretty good right now. What about Singapore? We had one person uh, in here from Singapore. Sure. Singapore, China. Yes. Yes. We cannot take customers from Hong Kong, but Singapore, absolutely. China, absolutely. Um, Everywhere in Europe, absolutely. You know, there's there's a couple. The next country we're approving, hopefully within two weeks, is Colombia. But um, um, countries that have an issue with, you know, money laundering, just, you know, and it, it and it's not us. It's just the regulators. There are some countries out there that are difficult, but um, like we have viewers from 168 countries, but we only can take 65 countries right now for accounts. But what, what about be- India? India. I need to check on India. India's an issue sometimes. We have customers. I think India is a yes. But I need to just, you just need to send a letter to support for us. I'm pretty sure India is a yes. Okay. Well, Tom, you have been super gracious with your time. As always, we really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. If anybody has any doubts, uh, you know, there's there's really nothing to lose to, sn- to sign up for the small exchange. I would encourage everybody to do so. I've already done it. And uh, we really look forward to hearing more about this, Tom. Thanks for your time.
I'm available for you anytime. That was a great, you asked great questions. I appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone.